Welcome to the MOOC on Pacific Studies offered by the University of the South Pacific. My name is Frank Thomas, Senior Lecturer in Pacific Studies at the Oceania Center for Arts, Culture and Pacific Studies. I am your presenter for this session, which is on critique of representations in the Pacific. At the end of the session, you will be able to examine how Pacific societies have been portrayed across time and space, reflect on the dominant representations and discourses in the Pacific and their meanings on and for the people, places and events, and develop the ability to integrate various perspectives to represent the Pacific in ways that are more relevant meaningful and reflective of people's beliefs and experiences. Western thinking about the Pacific evolved as a result of changing experiences with the region's inhabitants. In this presentation, we will examine a selected group of outsiders that have impacted to various degrees specific societies, as well as having portrayed them in ways that largely reflected their own cultural biases. These included early explorers, traders, whalers, beachcombers, missionaries, and colonial officials. European explorers from the beginning of the 16th century to the second half of the 18th century were normally short-term visitors, although some, such as Captain James Cook, made repeated visits. By contrast, traders, whalers, beachcombers, missionaries, and colonial administrators sometimes resided for extended periods of time. Their background provided contrasting images of the Pacific. Across time and space, Pacific Islanders were equally exposed to different experiences of culture contact, which they transmitted to their descendants via oral traditions. However, because Westerners left the written accounts and became the dominant power, their testimony have long influenced our understanding of local communities. As a result, until quite recently, Indigenous voices have been silenced or marginalized. We will also briefly examine how cultural encounters affected island communities and their environment, and alternative representations of the region by contemporary Pacific Islanders. While many Pacific Islands were not isolated, as originally believed before the first encounters with Europeans, their interaction spheres were largely limited to neighboring islands and archipelagos, particularly in the later stages of their history. All this was about to change when the first outsiders from beyond the region, the Spaniards, first entered the Pacific in the early 16th century. Following the discovery of the Americas, which was largely stimulated by finding a new route to the Spice Islands in the Far East, the Spaniards stumbled across the vast Pacific Ocean while crossing the Isthmus of Panama. In discovering a new route to Asia, the Spaniards became motivated to locate the legendary King Solomon's Mines as a result of their dealings with the Inca of Peru. They also sought to discover the alleged southern continent. Since the days of ancient Greeks, such a continent was believed to exist in order to, quote, balance the world. We can begin our written journey about the Pacific with Ferdinand Magellan's voyage in 1519 to 1521. Ninety-eight days from the start, the expedition finally reached the island of Guam in western Micronesia, the only inhabited island encountered during the arduous ocean crossing. By the time the, the ships reached Guam, many of the crews were starving and ill. The first contact with Pacific Islanders was marked by conflict primarily because two systems of property clashed. The Spaniards believed in private ownership, while the local inhabitants, like most indigenous groups in the region, stressed communal property sharing and expected to assimilate new arrivals, including their material possessions. As noted time and again, later castaways and beachcombers were often stripped of all their possessions upon landing on the beaches, including their clothes, that is, if they avoided being put to death on the spot. Indeed, it was widely accepted among Pacific Island societies that objects included stranded wooden logs, whales, and people could be disposed of by chiefs as they sought fit. 
Violence would thus characterize many first encounters, claiming lives on both sides, but a disproportionate number of indigenous people also suffered from introduced diseases for which they lacked immunity. From the 16th century to the second half of the 18th century, the Spanish galleons, which traded silver for Asian luxury goods between Mexico and the Philippines, missed most of the Pacific Islands because they sailed too far north. While written history began at different times across the Pacific Islands, knowledge of foreign ships and European trade items were known to communities that had not yet been contacted directly. When direct contact did take place, Pacific Islanders actively sought to interpret those visits in light of their own myths, traditional stories, and social structure, thereby challenging the idea that indigenous groups were simply passive observers. Instead, cultural contact may be seen as the unraveling of participation by local peoples in making their own history. The Spaniards continue their exploration until the early 17th century. By that time, the Dutch, French, and the English began to assert themselves politically and militarily by challenging Spain and Portugal's right to trade with the Spice Islands. It was not until some 150 years later that Pacific exploration resumed in a serious way. By that time, several of the early Spanish discoveries had been forgotten or misplaced by cartographers. 18th century Enlightenment philosophy in Europe encouraged the rise of a secular intelligentsia devoted to a science of humanity that was independent from the church and the Bible. It was believed that humanity had its origin not in the hands of God, but in an older form of society. What remained to be established was whether that society was a golden age or a state of chaos. In considering this question, the Enlightenment adopted an historical and anthropological approach to human cultural variability inspired by early encounters with Native American societies. The Swiss-born philosopher Rousseau believed that humanity possessed an unconscious, innate, or natural morality superior to received religious ethics. Moreover, science, education, and knowledge, believed by most of Rousseau's contemporaries to contribute to humanity's well-being, was criticized by the former, in that such things progressively cut humanity off from innate morality. Rousseau instead believed that indigenous societies were, for the most part, at a stage of innocence, consistent with the idea of the noble savage, untainted by civilization and its institutions. Subsequent European discoveries, notably Bougainville's visit to Tahiti, were for a while interpreted in light of this conception of pre-literate humanity. In effect, Bougainville's description of Tahitian society, particularly the amorous predisposition of local women, reinforce this idea. The Polynesian islands thus acquired a reputation for the easy life and romance where social institutions, albeit not well understood, contributed to everyone's welfare. Among early European explorers of the Pacific, James Cook was noted for his multiple achievements in the areas of geography, including disproving the existence of the southern continent and the Northwest Passage between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, the natural sciences, and ethnography. His first voyage was to observe the transit of Venus across the sun from Tahiti, which had been visited the year before by Bougainville. The scientific aim was to calculate the sun's distance from Earth, but also to confirm the location of islands sighted by previous explorers and to make new discoveries. After Tahiti, Cook sailed towards New Zealand, previously reported by the Dutch. Although culture contact continued to be marred by incidents between Pacific Islanders and Europeans, trade provided an opportunity for a more peaceful interaction. He then proceeded to chart Australia's east coast. However, his fleeting encounter with indigenous Australians led him to draw certain conclusions about typological or racial classification of the people he had encountered thus far, 
and by extension, their level of cultural development in relation to a European benchmark. As a concept of race acquired its modernistic scientific meaning of a discrete, biologically determined major grouping with innate physical and mental characters, those who refuted, refuted the premise of common origin, human origin or present specific unity reconfigured human races as distinct species. Oceanic materials influenced and were invoked by both sides of the debate for and against human unity as enlightenment holism was challenged by taxonomy or racial classification. Peoples of the Central and Eastern Pacific of lighter skin color and with forms of social organization reminiscent of European societies were more favorably compared than the darker skinned inhabitants of the Southwest Pacific. The latter region was referred to as the Black Islands or Melanesia, distinct from the two other cultural areas, Polynesia and Micronesia, the many and small islands. Ironically, Cook met his demise and the Hawaiian Islands in 1779 among people classified as Polynesians, who had up to that point been described more favorably than neighboring Melanesians. Western sources recount the incident of a stolen longboat and the taking of a local hostage by Cook's men to ensure its return. The American anthropologist Marshall Solins has interpreted this story in light of the Hawaiians' alleged belief that Cook incarnated one of their gods, and that his unexpected return to the Big Island of Hawaii after a storm badly damaged one of the ship's masts had upset Hawaiian social structure. Thus, the idea of the noble savage exemplified by the portrait of Omai from the island of Rayatia near Tahiti, seen above on the left, had been tarnished and Europeans began to view all Pacific Islanders with growing suspicion, in need of moral instruction and civilizing. These tasks were going to fall on later missionaries. As the purpose of many Western expeditions to the Pacific had been to ascertain what commodities the region possess which could be in demand in the rest of the world, it is not surprising that traders and whalers became frequent visitors to the islands. The settlement of Port Jackson in New South Wales, Australia in 1788 had an immediate effect in accelerating the discovery of the Central Pacific Islands in that it led to the establishment of a new trade route from Australia to China. The new penal colony at Botany Bay, Botany Bay did not initially produce enough food to support its growing population. By the beginning of the 19th century, ships radiated out of Sydney Harbor to trade in commodities such as salted pork from Tahiti, sandalwood from Fiji, and a host of luxury items for the East Asian market. New Zealand also attracted whalers and sealers. New South Wales merchants were soon rivaled by their North American counterparts who ranged further and wider through Pacific waters and eventually dominated the trade in luxury goods and whaling. Hawaii soon became more than just a stopover. For about a decade in the first half of the 19th century, sandalwood was heavily exploited by American merchants with the active participation of Hawaiian chiefs. The Pacific Northwest's fur trade to China also passed through the islands. New Englanders were also making frequent calls at Sydney and other localities in search of other sources of sandalwood, pearl shell, and sea cucumbers. But of all the commercial, commercial ventures, the one most associated with them was whaling. Some Pacific Islanders signed up on foreign ships. Along with resident and itinerant traders, ships crews representing members of several different nationalities further influence indigenous Pacific societies. By the 1840s, European commercial penetration had reached virtually every island of consequence in Polynesia and was fast approaching the fringes of the still commercially unknown islands of Melanesia and Micronesia. 
Just as commercial shipping enabled Pacific Islanders to travel and experience new lifestyles, so too did it offer certain Westerners the same prospects. Initially, some had a new lifestyle forced upon them as a result of shipwreck, being marooned, or in some cases being kidnapped. These were the beachcombers, men who more often deliberately chose to live in an island community, accepting or at least tolerating its customs. Some, like William Mariner, was, were well-educated and left detailed accounts of their visit, as well as valuable ethnographic descriptions, albeit tainted by their own cultural biases. Mariner, whose ship had been plundered off Tongatapu, Tonga, was the sole survivor and under the protection of a local chief became in turn a chief. Beachcombers were most likely to be found where trading was busiest. Some even became respectable traders themselves and stayed on the islands for many years, marrying local women and sometimes establishing themselves permanently. Most beachcombers, however, stayed for a short time. Many had acquired a bad reputation given their background, but as a group they nevertheless acted as intermediaries between foreign ships and locals, paving the way in some cases for later traders, planters, missionaries, and colonial administrators. They facilitated a degree of intercultural understanding, particularly in giving islanders a much better introduction to western ways than the casual encounters with passing vessels. We might say that beachcombers were cultural brokers to a greater or lesser extent. Unlike missionaries, most beachcombers had no conscious desire to attempt to change island cultures. Some islanders themselves became beachcombers. Although they never completely disappeared, beachcombers were gradually reduced in numbers as the presence of missionaries and colonial administrators increased. In Polynesia and later in Melanesia, Protestant missionaries from England and America saw the prospect of converting large numbers of Pacific Islanders. Whether deliberately or not, missionaries contributed to some of the most radical changes among traditional Pacific societies. By discrediting the old religion, they essentially created a religious void that was quickly replaced by a new generation of islanders. Although they were initially met with resistance by local chiefs and priests who feared losing their authority, some missionaries skillfully enlisted their support, often in collusion with traders and government officials by supplying firearms or at least the political support needed to subvert the authority of rival chiefs. Needless to say, most missionaries discredited the idea of the noble savage and assumed instead that Western civilization was superior, not only technologically, but also morally. Several Pacific Islanders, especially Hawaiians, all once converted, were sent to other islands to preach the new religion. Soon, missions clashed with each other, especially the Catholics and Protestants, and their followers rekindled all rivalries made worse by the introduction of firearms and alcohol. By the 1850s, most of the inhabitants of Polynesia were considered Christians, and the mission frontier had shifted to Melanesia and Micronesia. Yet, such apparently extensive social and religious changes were not simply imposed by missionaries. Rather, they resulted from a much more complex process involving the interaction of islanders, missionaries, and commercial concerns. By the 1880s, competition among colonial powers was intensifying, partly for prestige and partly for strategic and economic gain. A scramble for colonial real estate began, usually by claims that Westerners would bring, quote, civilization to the islands. In some cases, local chiefs welcomed the tightening of foreigners' control to put an end to warfare exacerbated by the dealings of some traders and missionaries. Britain, from its bases in Australia and New Zealand, acquired a dozen colonies in the South Pacific. 
By 1900, every island had come under foreign control through destabilization, cession, or outright conquest. When a treaty was signed, it was essentially misunderstood by indigenous chiefs who often regarded it as a friendship agreement. European settlements expanded, particularly in places where climates were similar to Europe and North America, such as in Australia, New Zealand, New Caledonia, and Hawaii. These often caused local friction with local inhabitants and their leaders. Colonial governments collected taxes, recruited labor, and took land for the establishment of plantations and mines. Phosphate, for example, was actively mined on some islands to produce fertilizers, causing a great deal of environmental disruption. In short, colonial rule shifted power relations from previous periods of European contact. Relationships between outsiders and locals turn increasingly unequal, with Pacific Islanders losing more control over their own destiny, including, in some cases, their land. They also became increasingly dependent on a monetary economy and imports. With the voyages of Cook in the late 18th century, sexually transmitted diseases along with tuberculosis, smallpox, measles, and other infectious diseases spread quickly, disseminating Pacific Island populations. Isolated from continental areas for millennia, Pacific Islanders had little immunity to introduce diseases. Population losses were exacerbated by blackbirding or forced labor recruitment. In some areas, this may have paved the way for partial forest recovery. However, introduced cattle, goats, pigs, and other animals soon multiplied to large numbers, filling niches that had been opened by depopulation and extending into native forests. Exotic flora such as guava in Hawaii thrive in niches opened by grazing animals. Bird life, already reduced following the arrival of indigenous people, suffered additional predation by the European rat. Mosquitoes sometimes carried avian or bird malaria. Cats, mongoose, and other animals were introduced to control rat populations, but these became pests in their own right, leading to further decline in native birds. International markets for sandalwood, whales, seals, tortoise shells, pearl oysters, and sea cucumbers brought further devastation to terrestrial and marine ecosystems. In large islands, ranching and plantation crops triggered large-scale clearance of native forests. In New Zealand and Hawaii, islanders were deprived of much of their land, outnumbered by European, American, and other immigrants from Asia. Mining has destroyed much of the land surface on Nauru, a raised coral island in Micronesia, and has caused severe pollution on some Melanesian islands. Nuclear testing has rendered some Micronesian islands uninhabitable, displacing their population and exposing others to radiation. A growing number of Pacific scholars have reacted to Western intellectual dominance. They have criticized not only the work and representations of contemporary Western scholars, but also questioned the entire Euro-American experience with the Pacific as lacking objectivity and perpetuating stereotypes about non-Western peoples. Take, for example, the definition of a cultural boundaries in the Pacific. These boundaries which foreigners apply to indigenous peoples reveal more about their ideas of representation than they do about indigenous models of group identity. To this day, the Polynesians are often portrayed as sensual and hospitable, while Melanesians are typically described in less flattering terms. The 19th century French explorer, Germain Durville, is credited for mapping the Pacific the way most people understand it today namely through the three categorizations of Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia, using geographical as well as ethnic and racial labels. Although there is some justification for clustering the Polynesians on the basis of close linguistic, biological, and ethnographic similarities, the complexity of Micronesia actually settled from two directions separated by several centuries, and especially Melanesia, precludes simple classification. For example, 
By examining the archaeological record about 3,000 years ago, the Lapita cultural complex of the southwest Pacific straddled the boundaries of Melanesia and present-day Western Polynesia. The Lapita culture is believed to be associated with the expansion of Austronesian speakers from island Southeast Asia, who incorporated elements, including plant domesticates, from previously established cultural traditions in the Southwest Pacific, going back to more than 40,000 years ago. The Lapita people produced a distinctive pottery using a dentate stamp decoration technique, combining geometric, animal, and anthropomorphic designs as seen above. We saw earlier that some Pacific societies fulfilled European expectations of life on an earthly paradise. Then a shift in thinking occurred which saw a need to convert and civilize indigenous populations. With the consolidation of colonial control and the development of tourism, Pacific Islanders were once again cast in a different light with a revival of the noble savage representation. In conclusion, by decentering history, Pacific studies aim to show that Pacific history is not a set of unambiguous facts. Rather, our understanding are influenced by the biases of our sources and experiences, and are bound up with our own contexts such as class, ethnicity, gender, education, and political persuasion, which all influence our perspectives. Decentering the practice of history in the Pacific requires a recognition that writing is but one form of historical expression, and that we must recognize other ways of quote-unquote writing. For example, tattooing, seeing, and knowing about the past. In this YouTube video as part of additional resources, Greg Vorak of Itotsubashi University in Japan discusses history in and from the Pacific and invokes personal memory to demonstrate the connectedness of islands in memory, history, and across time and space. Other additional resources have been included in this presentation.